I want to welcome you to the second of our Institute Encounters, sponsored by the Institute for the Study of Western Civilization at Texas Tech University. Our guest today is Professor Frederick Turner. Professor Turner is Founders Professor of Arts and Humanities at the University of Texas, Dallas. He is a polymath uh, in every sense of the term, uh, a scholar of literature, a thinker about science and the human prospect, and an accomplished artist as a poet, author of many different poems as well as epic poetry. Uh, about which he will speak later today. Uh, what I'd like to do with this interview is discuss with Professor Turner something that he has given a unique quality of thought to, uh, the relationship between arts and humanity as a biological organism and human history as a biological process. Um, this is a subject that has particular interest to me uh, and one about which Professor Turner has thought with uncommon penetration and an unusual synthesis of disparate areas of knowledge. So let me begin first of all by welcoming you and thanking you for Thank coming you. here and participating in this interview and just asking a very simple question uh, what does our biologies tell us about our capacities for art and culture um, uh, human beings all over the world make art and um, they make poetry they they, they, they make representational um, paintings, drawings, sculptures, uh, they dance, they, they make architecture that is not just uh, utilitarian, um, they tell stories and so on and so forth. Um, uh, traditionally a lot of these activities are uh, engaged in together in a, what, you know, what Wagner called a Gesamtkunstwerk, a, a, a kind of a, 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 a collective work, and that's usually the same thing as ritual. It's and ritual is the way that human beings make uh, the the major transitions and make the major collective decisions um, uh, in in their lives. And um, given the universality of this kind of behavior it begins to look as if this is something which is not some kind of arbitrary thing that was just thought up somewhere, but something that is embedded in us and uh, something that I I if we, um, let, let, let's put it this way, we have survived, we have survived with those kinds of practices it makes a good deal of sense, sort of a priori, that, uh, that, that those practices have actually helped us survive, that they are in fact part of our <coughs> uh, armory, our collection of <coughs> capacities like you know, being able to see, being able to hear, being able to speak. The language seems to be something that human beings do, uh, even if they're not introduced to language. I mean, deaf and dumb children will come up spontaneously with sign language. But so many on, people so are inclined to yeah. think of art as a kind of expendable luxury, a, a, an entertainment, yeah. something maybe even a great art, something a touch frivolous about it. In, in what way do you think uh, our, our species has been able to prosper uh, in, in survival terms as a result yeah. of, of art? How yeah, I, well, yeah, first of all, um, uh, you could say that uh, uh, art in the sense of these, as it were, expensive and unnecessary activities that, that we do and uh, that we find in, in ri collectively in ritual, um, 
these are um, uh, 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 these are ways of, as I said, managing life crisis rituals. One of the great life crisis rituals is marriage. Marriage is fundamental. Seems you know, all human societies have some form of marriage. Marriage is the way that the human species reproduces itself, and does so in a in a manner that ensures the the uh, the nurture of of the young. Now, m marriage, you could say, uh, is uh, is always a well, <laughs> always a matter of choice. Sometimes, uh, perhaps preferentially it's the choice of the two marriage partners and uh, whatever the system that that does figure it's very hard to get people to marry that really don't want to marry um, but sometimes the choice is also made by the family but the point is it's a matter of choice and that means that different suitors or different brides are being um, selected uh, as against others and they're being selected for, for a whole range of possible qualities. In other words, what you've got here is, is something that, um, let's say, animal breeders would recognize immediately as a kind of domestication process, as a process of, of breeding. So we've, we've been in, involved in what you might call this sort of free market individualistic eugenics for, uh, you know, for, 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 for millions and millions of years. And what is the role of art? And the role of art is uh, the role of uh, 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 art is the I mean ritual is made of various art forms. Mm -hmm. These art forms are uh, they they require qualities of ingenuity, of invention, of uh, organization, of design, of uh, uh, the recognition of beauty. And we can maybe talk about beauty later on because I want to argue that beauty is a, is a very, very useful kind of thing to know about. Um, uh, uh, but all of those things require uh, you know, extraordinary um, mental, imaginative capacities. They require the kinds of capacities that, that, that make human beings unique as a species. So in a sense, the human species was the one that managed to find a way of making itself smarter, more sensitive, more, a ability, more able to, to be reflective about itself, more able to, to criticize itself, more able to communicate on a wide range of uh, levels. Um, art, for instance, is a, is a way of communicating it, it, you know, in a broadband kind of m multiple way as opposed to something like a simple signal art can can convey a, a whole world a whole sort of set of experiences and great art as we know um, uh, you know you say a Shakespeare play or something like that uh, the amount of information that is poured from one mind from Shakespeare's own dead mind into ours is, is staggering so it, it, it's uh, so all of those all of those capacities are capacities that um, are uh, you know really useful for human beings for you know practical purposes like you know hunting gathering you know child raising colle uh, uh, collective activities like building homes um, technology uh, uh, healing uh, recognition of uh, of, of the seasonal differences, uh, you know, understanding of the landscape, and so on, and so on, and so on. It, the, 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 this, is, this is our way of breeding us into being better human beings and at all the things that human beings are good at that make them, uh, that made them so but successful. But let's come to that question of, of beauty. Mm -hmm. Not all of what you describe would necessarily be experienced as beautiful. Um, some of it would be and that beauty adds something to the rest, or at least creates a kind of attraction to whatever the rest of it is that otherwise would not be as powerful. Uh, but maybe you can enlarge uh, on, well, on, on that. It may be I would use that kind, of, um, that kind of language. I don't think that beauty is something that you can sort of slather on to the surface of something that is already there. Um, it's not a prettying up of something. 
It's not that you have a, a utilitarian structure and then, and then you sort of uh, uh, make something pretty on it. Then, and what, uh, under what circumstances does it emerge and what does that emergion reflect? Well, in one sense, um, beauty is, is, is the internal uh, characteristic of uh, of synergy among all of the parts of something. Um, uh, I mean, take for instance the Gothic cathedral. You've got tremendous constraints of you know what you can do with stone. I mean, stone is very good at comp uh, it has great compression strength, but not very good shear strength or torsion strength or tension strength. So. Um, in a sense, the 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 the, uh, the the beauty of the Gothic cathedral, the kinds of forms, curves, arches, and so on, that that you find in it are um, are, are, are are organic to it. It's not that you 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 know you put up your cathedral and then you make some nice arches and forms because they're pretty. Uh, the, it's 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 inherent in the object itself. Um, uh, th there's some truth, although I sometimes argue with it, there's some truth in the modernist idea that form follows function. And I think they're getting it part of the idea that, 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 it's, that it's, it's not something you just put on the surface. Uh, certainly Yeats, uh, William Butler Yeats, would write out a paraphrase of his poem before he turned it into poetry. Mm -hmm. But that's really like, um, uh, you know, the paraphrase is really like Pentimentius, like the line drawing that a, that a, a painter will make mm -hmm. uh, that is going to be covered, uh, going to be covered up with, uh, with paint. Um, uh, the, the, it's the painting, not the sketch, that, that, is, that constitutes the work of art and does the very powerful emotional and psychological things that art does. So I would say that beauty is something that is, well, not skin deep. Um, and in fact, it's the, uh, one of the things that I have been studying from a variety of viewpoints, you know, scientific and philosophical and, and literary and, and artistic and so on, has been beauty itself. And, um, Clearly, part of it is, uh, I mean, part of it can be directly related to reproductive success. You know, I mean, beautiful people are more, you know, attractive and, you know, in a world where you don't have birth control, you, you know, it means that, that beautiful people are probably, probably going to have that, more that, that, that's, that's often taken as being uh, an indicator of underlying health and fitness. Um, although the, there's something very peculiar about human beauty, it's sort of like the difference between a great star and a nice piece of cheesecake or, or beefcake, you know, uh, the, 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 the most beautiful, the most attractive film stars are not necessarily the most, you know, classically beautiful. Uh, it's, it's not just the promise of reproductive success, although that can be a, a sort of... Uh, 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 yeah, that's the meat and potatoes of the of the thing. It's it also the the that there's also the whole you know the elegance of the of the the, the gourmet chef that has gone into it. If you see what I mean, um, uh, one of the one of the things that that. that that I found out about beauty is that beauty certainly does require uh, elements of order and of symmetry mm -hmm. and so on, but it also requires elements of order breaking and symmetry breaking mm -hmm. and a, a vitality, a, dy a dynamism. And, uh, you know, we find um, regular geometrical forms beautiful, but we find fractal forms that are formed, that, you know, that are the result of of continuous feedback processes, um, we find them more beautiful. They, they, they have a greater depth to them. 
So um, the, uh, the, the experience of beauty is the experience, it's the ability to take as a whole a whole mass of interacting elements and characteristics. Um, uh, whereas a, you know, a, a more rational, analytical way of thinking would only be able to take one and understand it, but wouldn't be able to see it as, as an interacting whole. Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of synthetic process. Um, but you, one could also say that, 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 that it, it's, it's the recognition of synthetic processes of, as well. That I think that if we, if we find a landscape beautiful, then is essentially we're finding it, not necessarily consciously, but unconsciously, we're finding it to be a landscape that is likely to be productive of, of new events and uh, of, uh, of, of interesting things that might, that might happen. If we, if we uh, you know, if we find, it, you know, we find flowers beautiful and flowers are the, they are the reproductive organs of plants, are the promise of more flowers to the, in, in the future. You know, we find um, uh, 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 tools beautiful because they, that they, they have within them the capacity for doing all kinds of things. It's, a, it's the, it's the promise of something uh, it's a potentiality for the for the future. Of something good. So, so I, I can recall Leo Wilson writing that our favorite landscapes mm. are kind of parkland seen from height. Golf courses, basically. Golf courses, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Golf, golf courses. courses. Like golf courses <laughs> they they replicate that kind of landscape. It's wonderful. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, so you're seeing it from a height, you can take yes. it all in. Yes. It's open enough so that you can see what, what's down there. You well, wanna, there's enough trees so you can hide. Enough trees to yes. hide in there's water. Yes. And, and it's cool. green. Right. Yeah. Right. It's not, you know, we like seashores because seashores are, you know, usually, you know, fabulously rich in life forms. And, and, but we can also like deserts because uh, the, 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 there, there are, um, uh, there, there are advantages to de deserts. Will very often have you know all kinds of you know game and, and interesting and odd plants and so on. It's it's you know mountains. What, what, what about what about music? What what are the, the the biological underpinnings of musical beauty? Well, this is this is quite wonderful because there are new. There's a whole mass of new work being done on what goes on in the brain when people. Learn, train in mu train to be musicians or experience music and so on. Um, one of the things that happens when we experience something is that uh, processes happen in our brain. Those processes don't just happen in a kind of fixed substrate. They actually transform the substrate. It's as if uh, it, as if you had a, a computer and every piece of information you put into it slightly altered the wiring of the computer. Mm -hmm. um, so what music does is in a very powerful and direct way um, actually affects the, the wiring of the human brain. And maybe l let me backtrack a little uh, some of the work that's been done, been done by a brilliant friend of mine, French, uh, a French scientist, Rémi Lestien, um, uh, has shown that, um, uh, let's say, a thought or a feeling or an experience in the brain uh, is, uh, it can be described neurally as a very, very complex feedback circuit mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. neurons firing. But the neurons are firing through uh, synaptic uh, bulbs uh, uh, and synaptic clefts. Mm -hmm. That's where the neurons connect with each mm -hmm. other. And uh, when a neuron fires, it will fire in such a way that the impulse, the, the, sometimes it, one neuron will be connected to another with several connections. 
And it's the rhythm in which the connections are made that is helping to carry the, the meaning of the thought, so to speak. In other words, what's going on, I mean, thinking is, in a sense, it's a kind of neural music. So music, in fact, is very, very, you know, the, 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 ear, the ear is actually recording the, the, uh, the, the rhythmic signature of the music and putting it directly into the brain. And so, in a sense, it's, it's rewiring the brain. And, and, you know, with the new studies of the brain through functional magnetic resonance imaging, you can sort of see this going on. It's very exciting. So it's not just that there might have been the Platonic conception, uh, Pythagorean conception, uh, music of the spheres. There's actually music of our brain, that the yeah. world of music... Yeah. Uh, kind of nests within or stimulates or, or s yes. there's a kind of integration between yes. these two levels. Huh? Yeah. The, uh, it's, it's also a way of experiencing the world. It kind of re, it recalibrates, it, it, uh, it rejiggers the, the, the way that we experience the world. And, you know, we know this if we listen to, to great music. And the thing, of, the thing about great music is that I think that it does, it does in some strange way uh, sort of represent the the you know some of the deepest rhythms of the world the deepest natural rhythms of the world and i think this is a field which you know people are going to be studying more in the future it, it's still speculative now but uh, i think music does in some sense represent something i mean some people say it's not representative but i think you know maybe not as directly as 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 a, a novel which represents people interacting or a poem or a, mm -hmm. you know or, or a painting it does represent uh, so it, it it is a form of information we are finding out about the universe when we listen to music well just as we are the products mm -hmm. of evolution mm -hmm. and the culture that we make evolves mm -hmm. uh, so too i would suppose uh, from what you've said that 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 art evolves too uh, it evolves in, in, in within the environment of the society where it occurs, but it, but it, but it evolves also as part of a learning process, um, optimally at least, sort of becoming a more masterful kind of art as, as time goes on. Do you think that corresponds to what actually happens? Well, uh, frankly, no. I mean, I don't think anybody has written <coughs> significantly better than Homer and uh, Shakespeare and Virgil and, uh, and so on, and Goethe and... and uh, you know, the great, the great, the great poets. Uh, you know, we we know enough Roman and we well we know quite a lot about Greek sculpture and you know it's still state of the art um, and Roman painting. We we know enough about Roman painting to know that that we we have some examples like the you know the house of the um, of the. The the the, uh, uh, the priestess uh, in um, Pompeii to know that they that they were no slouches. Um, There's certainly been a multiplication of media, though. A multiplication of media, um, and what I'd say is something like this: that it, it's not that new works of art are kind of in some kind of evolutionary improvement way better than old works of art it's that new works of art actually add to the body of mm -hmm. uh, 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 of art that uh, art does progress in that new works of art are added to it sometimes the addition the rate of the addition is is huge as in say you know classical athens or renaissance england or something like that um, uh, and sometimes it's slower um, uh, but it, it, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a sort of accumulating body of, of is the aesthetic experience of the universe and of the human race. So there's a sort of aesthetic ecology which becomes ever more rich with time. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes, right. yes. Um, I mean, in, in, in certain forms of art, certainly in, in, in music for a long time, mm. uh, there in retrospect at least seems to have been a, 
an increasing Western music, increasing development of complexity, polyphony, uh, development of large orchestras, big ensembles of instruments of various kinds, pieces written for them of various kinds, uh, feels like opera, there seems to be that kind of development, uh, perhaps with pauses and some retrogressions, but a kind of general forward moving. Is that unusual? Um, is, 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 uh, if to that characterization of the last thousand years or so of, of Western music is, is, is accurate, uh, is that something simply that's a peculiarity of, of music history? Or uh, you seem to be suggesting that it's not the general pattern that you see. Well, Jacob Burkhardt did come up with this uh, theory of um, uh, that, that, that an art form will go through a sort of uh, a, a sort of nascent period. It, 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 it's sort of an early, undeveloped, immature form, and then then it will uh, get into its um, it, it, its early maturity, and then it will get into its classical phase, and then it will get into a, a, a sort of um, uh, what was the next uh, term that he used? Uh, um, uh, a sort of expressionist phase, and then a baroque phase, and then finally a rococo phase, in which it's become too refined, too too elaborated, too too much. Uh, uh, there's too much self-reference in it. That 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 it's sort of gradually. The, the 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 growing tree has uh, overextended itself and is no longer getting the healthy sap from the popular and folk roots of it. And um, uh, I think you can see that happening in 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 whole in a whole range of uh, of uh, uh, of artistic genres. And I think that did happen with <coughs> you know with uh, Western music. I, 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 uh, different people would disagree about different things. I mean, some of us would say, well, in fact, you know, it's, the, it's Bach and that, that period that is the, 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 that is the peak. Mm -hmm. And some would say, well, no, it's Mozart. And some would say it's Beethoven. But, you know, as you go on from there, you're going to get fewer and fewer mm -hmm. defenders. You know, maybe there might be some sort of Marlerians. I mean, uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, the... the no, no one would claim Philip Glass, you think? I uh, actually, yeah. actually like Philip Glass, and I'm sort of looking in a way in, in some kinds of, uh, in various kinds of music, I'm sort of uh, including pop music and um, uh, 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 you know, all the various genres of, of popular music uh, you know, from, from highly popular, highly commercial kinds to highly uncommercial kinds. I'm looking for you know, where the, where the next cycle of music is going to come from. And uh, world music, that's another area that is very interesting. There's all these kind of meldings of musical traditions and maybe something is coming out of that. So that, that's sort of the way I would, the way I would see it. So you think there's a, we're sort of at a point of, of promise in that you have various yes. streams yes. flowing into one another, yes. huh? Yes. What what uh, it, there, you know there are there are other aspects uh, to art um, uh, beside the sort of synthetic processes mm -hmm. you're talking about. Uh, art has a relationship to technology as oh, yes. well as it yes. evolves. Yes. Art evolves too. Um, we're certainly at a point in modern history. Uh, in which technological progress, I think, as it impacts mm -hmm. on art, mm -hmm. is proceeding with immense rapidity. Oh, yeah. um, is, is, this, is this something that sort of leaves you full of expectation and uh, oh, a much. wish to see yeah. the next yeah. 30 or 40 years unfold? Uh, uh, in the sense of my area of study, I, I started out as, you know, as being interested in Renaissance literature and Shakespeare and you know, the great Renaissance writers. And so um, I, I'm inclined to sometimes use words in a Renaissance sense. And in the Renaissance, the word art covered what we would call technology. 
that essentially art and technology were the same thing. And uh, they also use the word art in the sense that we use, we talk about the liberal arts. And they also, but they also use it as, you know, the way we talk about, you know, the art of something, which mm -hmm. we, by which we sometimes mean the craft of something. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're not sort of in this modernist way, sort Science of refined it down to... E e yeah, well. e yeah a, a scientist would sometimes be called an artist, mm -hmm. especially if they were an experimental scientist. Or, or, and or a craftsman amazing. might have a yeah. science that he practiced. Exactly. And so um, uh, I, it seems to me that uh, one of the things that's going on is that, I mean, for instance, it's fairly clear that the development of computer technology has been pretty much spearheaded by the demands of games, mm -hmm. you know, of, of computer games. That, that, that uh, um, uh, you know, computers have got better and better, faster and faster by Moore's law, mm -hmm. pre precisely because uh, um, people wanted to play games on them. And then they found that you know, you know, all that circuitry could do a whole lot of other things like run businesses and mm -hmm. you know, test out scientific hypotheses and, uh, and so on and so on and so on. They so say that the space program had all these wonderful offshoots, but it's gaming nowadays, that's the kind of functional equivalent. Right, right, but the space program probably came out of early science fiction, you know, that people actually could actually conceive of those things. Uh, you know, uh, you might say art is the, let's say, the R&D kind of side of, uh, of technology. Uh, you yourself are a, a practicing poet. Mm -hmm. uh, that is your personal art, so to speak. Yes. Um, and and, and uh, where does poetry stand in all of this, both in terms of its roots in our nature as a species and in terms of uh, its, its movement uh, in, in the contemporary moment? Well, um, here, you know, I'm, I'm sort of still, as it were, embroiled in a, in, in, in a, in a sort of debate that's going on. So um, you have to take what I say with a grain of salt. Um, I try to be, as far as the scientific aspects of this are concerned, I try to be as objective as I can. Um, uh, but other people might uh, object to the conclusions that I draw. Um, but uh, uh, a, uh, many, many years ago, I think in the 80s, I ran into, a, early 80s actually, I ran into a rather brilliant uh, German neuroscientist, Ernst Puppel. And um, I, at that time, had been um, looking for, uh, I was becoming very interested in, in the te technique of poetry, the techniques of poetry, particularly meter, um, rhyme schemes, stanza forms, uh, and so on. And I wanted, you know, because I was young, relatively young, and, you know, wanted to, uh, to do something new, uh, uh, an ambition that I now begin to feel sort of uh, uh, really unnecessary. I think you, you know, one's either going to do something new or one, one isn't, and you know, all the kind of striving in the world isn't going to make it very much newer. Um, but uh, at that time, I wanted to do something new, so I was looking around for other kinds of meter than the one than the familiar kind. So I started looking at Anglo-Saxon meter as opposed to you know, the, the, the uh, stress meter that we have and, and so on. And uh, then I got um, into looking at meters from other countries, from other, from other nations. And, you know, being an anthropologist's son, I had access to lots of traditions beyond Europe, inclu including Europe, but beyond Europe. And so I started to find all kinds of different meters, you know, the French Alexandrine, you know, but then meters, beautiful meters from... Uh, uh, you know, from, from, from Thailand and, uh, you know, uh, and from New Guinea and, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Japan and, uh, you know, uh, uh, Arabic and, mm -hmm. uh, and so on and so on and so on. And um, uh, I began to notice something in looking at all of these metrical forms. And that was, in a sense, it was something that was so blindingly obvious that I couldn't see it. And that is, that all human beings seem to compose poetry in lines, which is very odd if you think about it. I mean, it, 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 it's as if, and you know, lines of a particular length. That the line, the line was uh, was always around three seconds long. Mm -hmm. It's as if you you know you had a a whole 
race of intelligent beings that, let's say, painted pictures, and the pictures were always between about two feet square and one and a half feet square. He said, well, why that? Why don't they make big pictures or very little ones? They make them only this size. Very odd. Um, so it, even more odd was when we started looking at them, and it turned out that not only do, do everybody write, does everybody write in lines, everybody compose in lines. I mean, it's no difference between a literate tradition or an oral tradition. Um, it's always about three seconds long. And by a line, you mean a succession of words after which there's a pause. After which there's a pause, yeah. yeah. And uh, which usually has some kind of grammatical integrity in itself, so you don't just uh, you know, break in the middle of an and or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, uh, and uh, then the, the lines themselves have a rhythmic, rhythmic in integrity that is repeated from line to line with variations, with lots of variations, but it's a basic rhythmic integrity to each line, and that the ends of the lines, are off, or, or the beginnings of the lines, are often accentuated with something, mm -hmm. particularly rhyme. Mm -hmm. um, and this seems to be um, you know, across the, the world. And other people, well, we published a piece on it called The Neural Liar, Poetic Meter, The Brain and Time, uh, in which, uh, which has been you know, reprinted a lot and is now you know, fairly fundamental to the field of audiology and speech pathology and has, a, you know, has been used extensively in studying communications between mothers and newborns. It's related to short-term memory, perhaps? It's related to short-term memory. What it came down to was that um, uh, you know, we can remember about three seconds' worth of information, and then we, kind of, uh, we, we make a, a, a very quick mental extract of it and push it down so that we do, it's not in our way when we experience the next three, three seconds. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, if you drive that rhythm, that, 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 that rhythm the, um, uh, by means of an external stimulus, um, you get a, a, a measurable changes in brain state and brain chemistry. Uh, ri ritual chanting, for instance, is is a very good example, and that's actually been studied. You know, you can look at the brain chemistry of people chanting, and, and it's a different brain chemistry. And the same thing uh, with uh, you know work songs and uh, and and military chants and songs. You know, uh, would that apply to the rhythmic movement without chanting? Would that result um, in brain chemistry changes? It. It can, you know, that kind of chanting, that kind of rhythmic behavior can go along with dancing or, or, or mm -hmm. movement or not. I mean, it usually is with movement, but, but uh, it, you, you can sort of uh, uh, sit very quietly and say to yourself, you know, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare Hare, and so on, three in three second lines. Or you can use it as, you know, to rouse up a crowd. And almost everywhere in the world, if you rouse up a crowd, you've got to have a chant. And the chant almost always, it's almost always a, like a, something like a, a, a trochaic tetrameter. It goes da 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 um, now, what poetry does is it makes variations on that. Mm -hmm. So instead of, you know, shall I compare thee to a summer's day, thou art more lovely and more temperate, which is, would be mm -hmm. the, the, the basic meter. It's, shall I compare thee to a summer's day, thou art more lovely and more temperate. And so you can hear the, the chant underneath, but then on the surface there's this elegant, mm -hmm. civilized variations on the basic emotional drive. Um, so, well, uh, th what this set of discoveries, um, there's also very interesting stuff because you know, we, we process language usually with the left side of the brain, everybody knows that. <coughs> the right side of the brain processes pro prosody, and prosody is, this, is the term we use for the rhythm and music of poetry, among other things. And so what happens when you uh, have metered poetry is I, I, the, you're using the whole brain rather than half of the brain. You're, 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 uh, it's in stereo, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And also, there's very strong evidence 
uh, of all kinds that this makes language much, much more memorable. Mm -hmm. So it makes it, I was talking about the, you know, the, the synapses, it, it, it makes it much easier for a piece of language or an idea to become embedded in our actual, uh, the, actual wi the actual wiring of our, of, of, you know, of our, of our, of our brains. And uh, when, you know, when you don't have writing and other forms of recording, uh, that is the way that you know, uh, uh, tradition and knowledge is passed, information is passed down from one generation to another. So it's a way of facilitating information storage. Uh, 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 yeah, exactly, and and retrieval too, of course, because you know if you if you know what the meter is, then you can sometimes bring back what the words are if they're they're hazy in your head. Does it does it prime the brain for anything else? Does it create a state of readiness for other things? It tends uh, well. Ritual chanting is very much associated with cooperative action between human beings. It makes many human beings act as if they're one, mm -hmm. and so that their unit of selfishness, so to speak, becomes the group rather than the individual. Um, uh, but it also, it also makes possible a state of relaxed awareness. It's related to the, the effects of the alpha rhythm, and uh, therefore a, a, an ability to reflect on things, uh, an ability to, uh, to to take things in as a whole rather than, um, you know, narrowly focus on something. Um, it's it's the, uh, related to the ability to synthesize all kinds of things. Kind of and, and also metaphor. It makes, huh? it makes us l much more able to recognize and experience metaphor. Ra you, know, if, you know, it is the East and Juliet is the Sun. Um, if you say Juliet is the Sun, then you, you know, you're liable to, if you're being rational, you say, well, Juliet is not a huge ball of flaming hydrogen, you know. I mean, <laughs> you put it in meter, you put it in, a, in, 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 that, in that form, and the, the metaphor comes through, and it's easier for it to come through. Well, obviously, um, this set of understandings about meter and, and rhyme and so on uh, it caused a little bit of a revolution in the whole poetic community, which had sort of mm -hmm. decided that free verse was, in fact, uh -huh. better than these old sort of nursery rhyme-sounding rhythms and meters and and so on. And they, that that, that, that uh, uh, you know, it, it looked as if they were missing out on this enormously powerful and ancient shamanic sort of uh, neural technology, psychological technology that, that, that we'd had for all these thousands of years, tens of thousands of years, you know. So um, uh, a, 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 the, 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 the debate is still going on. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, but the new formalism came out of this set of mm -hmm. discoveries and mm -hmm. it's now sort of pretty much everywhere. There's even a Vietnamese new formalism, uh -huh. uh, believe it or not, which I've kind of been involved with to some extent. Here's a case where scientific research has influenced the direction of art. Oh, well, h hugely, but in a sense it influenced it by pre precisely by understanding it as art, mm -hmm. which is kind of interesting. Just one more question as you were Talking about that, I kind of wondered whether anyone had investigated whether uh, these kinds of mental experiences mm. poetry provides, other forms of art as well, might in fact be good for you in a general way, might be conducive to health and well-being. Considerable evidence that yes, it, it, uh, they are. I mean, there's, a, there's a British, uh, 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 I forgot which university, but the British researchers have found that, that poetry can in fact have a uh, a, 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 uh, uh, you know, when understood, I mean, a lot of these things sort of there has to be some kind of understanding. Um, uh, with music, you don't need very much, but you know, with poetry, you need a bit more mm -hmm. to appreciate great visual art. You know, uh, we've got a basic set of capacities for picking it up, but there are, you can train, you can be trained to see to to do it better. But it is good for you. So I might consider trading in my daily swim for a daily poetry session. Well, adding it. Adding it. Poetry session to your daily swim. <laughs> you know, I mean, you, you're in great shape, Steve. You know, don't, want the, don't let that go. <laughs> well, with that advice, let me thank you very much for a, a, a very illuminating discussion. Uh, and um, uh, 
our audience should stay tuned for for more as the year as the year progresses, the academic year progresses. Thank you, uh, Professor Turner. Thank you.